Hi y'all, in this video I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the false equivalencies between stupid shit that Trump has said versus stupid shit that Hillary Clinton has said. People will talk about Trump and the First Amendment, or Trump and this, and Trump and that, and the things they're talking about requires Trump and the Congress to cooperate to get it done, and indeed, uh, down the road, the courts to go along with what the President and the Congress have done. Whereas some of the things that Hillary Clinton has talked about are things that are properly uh, only decided by the President. So, um, on military matters, if you think about Trump uh, when he was taken to task for not seeming to know what the nuclear triad is, that's a trivial detail. The president doesn't uh, need to know the inter intricacies of how the missiles actually physically get launched and, and, and that kind of thing. So when the president gives an order to launch a missile, the president isn't thinking about, do I want to make sure this missile comes from a, a ship? Do I want this missile to come from a plane? He wants the target destroyed, and, you know, general in charge of you know, this space, go make this thing go boom. And then the general pushes the orders down, and the people um, who actually do the tactical component decide on a targeting solution, and they turn the keys and the missiles fly. The president does not get involved at that level. Um, whereas Hillary Clinton has talked about imposing a no-fly zone in Syria, where we'd get the legal authority to impose a no-fly zone on a sovereign nation is mysterious to put it uh, charitably, but suppose that we do impose this no-fly zone. And then she is asked, what do you do if Russia or Syria refuse to obey it? They just start violating uh, this no-fly zone that you have imposed. And her response was something like, a very kumbaya, let's sit around the campfire, cook some s'mores, and I will explain to them while we hold hands why it would be a good idea to have it. The question isn't if it would be a good idea to have it if they agreed or not. The question is, assume that you think it's a good idea, and assume that they think it's a bad idea, and then you impose it, putting off to the side uh, the question of whether or not we have the legal authority to impose it. You impose this no-fly zone, they violate it. What are your orders to the, the men on the front line in respect to that violation of our claimed airspace, the airspace that we claim uh, the right to decide who can fly and who cannot fly? Well, you have two options. Uh, you're, you can show that you're bluffing. Your inner coward can come out and you retreat, which isn't going to show Putin and Syria that uh, we're very serious. Or you open fire. You have to commit an overt act of war. That is a decision that only the president gets to make. And by putting people in these situations, putting these people in that no-fly zone, um, there will be rules of engagement that will be given to them from the outset, so if a certain set of circumstances happen, these military officers flying the planes will respond in particular ways. So every captain or lieutenant or lieutenant colonel, whoever's flying that day, out there will be the one who is in charge of deciding by his actions whether or not the United States has committed itself to armed conflict because of the conditions that the president, in his or her uh, plenary power, has decided to make patent. So, when she talks about that no-fly zone, that is a directly aggressive act against two sovereign powers, and in order to defend it requires the commitment to engage in armed conflict with both Syria and Russia. That is a pathway to war. Now, Trump didn't know what the nuclear triad is. He should read up on it, of course, but that's not the type of decision that a president needs to really focus on any more than he needs to worry about whether or not the platoon that's actually going to take the objective is first platoon or second platoon. That is not something that happens at the level of the president. Curiously enough, um, Clinton should have been the one personally approving security arrangements for our missions around the world, but for some reason that wasn't done at the secretary level, notwithstanding the previous guidance from an uh, ARB that these decisions should be made personally by the secretary. But I'm sure that once she gets into office as president, she would totally have been the one uh, sitting there making all the decisions that the president only can make, in the same way that she was making the decisions that only the secretary was supposed to make, but she wasn't making either. Anyway, uh, so that got pushed down to another level. There's a way to proper, for things that are properly not at the level of the president, and things that uh, are properly at the level of the president. Tactical decisions are not properly at the level of the president. They're not military experts. They don't study in tactics and whatnot. They give general guidance. Um, whether or not to commit troops in the first place can only be made by the president, exclusively by the president. So that is a recipe for war. Now, the people will complain that Trump wants to 
Rather than reduce the number of nuclear weapons in the world, he wanted to increase them. It's not the number of nuclear weapons. I mean, that's a psychological thing, but it isn't the number of them that are the problem. It's their distribution. We could cut uh, the nuclear arsenal of the world down to 1% of what it is right now, and then give every state, every you know, not every nation in the world, three or, or whatever it is, and that would be a much worse state of affairs, even though we will have dramatically reduced the number of nuclear weapons. Trump wasn't saying we should give nuclear weapons to dictators. He's saying that we should... The, the, the main point there is that other countries need to start being responsible for their own protection because we simply can't afford um, you know, our $20 trillion debt to go around protecting the whole world. We're not Superman. We can't, you know, we need to be able to take off our cape and tights occasionally and let someone else fly around and save their own fucking country from something. And if that entails uh, a, re uh, a rethinking of how nuclear weapons are redistributed, then he's open to that. Now, I obviously don't want many of these countries to get nuclear weapons because I, the more places they are, the easier it is for one to go wrong somewhere, somehow, uh, outside of the control of the, the very few nuclear powers that we have. But, uh, again, that's a distribution issue, not a number of weapons that exist issue. After all, once you have enough weapons to destroy the entire world once over, every additional weapon does not improve your ability to do more damage. You can only destroy the world the one time. So there's this false equivalency between stupid shit that Trump has said versus the stupid shit that, the, that uh, Clinton uh, said. Clinton's claims on her military policy are things that only the president can decide, and once decided, do commit the nation to engage in armed conflict, whereas Trump's are about negotiation. He can't unilaterally decide uh, our, our nuclear policy for the distribution of arms throughout the world. That would require treaties, which would require Congress. And therefore, even if he is a little bit excessive in what he would want to do, the, one of the checks and balances in the system is for the Congress to constrain that impulse and to say, uh, not so fast there, uh, Mr. Trump. You just, you just hang on there, Mr. Grinch. Whereas, the uh, only way that the Congress can intervene on a president's decision to deploy troops somewhere is to impeach the president, which can only be done for high crimes and misdemeanors. You actually have to do something that violates a law. You have to commit treason, something like that. Or, to just stop funding the military. And people in Congress realize that it's not viable anymore to just cut off funding uh, to the government to get their way with the president. You, you just simply cannot do that. You, can, um, you are not going to do well if you stop, um, if you just cut off all the funds to the United States military, particularly given that we have people in combat zones around the world who will, as a consequence of not, no, no longer being supplied, will in fact get killed. And no politician is going to be making decisions that they know are, are uh, calculated to have the effect that they're going to get American troops killed for the sake of um, pressuring a president to do something that the Constitution vests uh, in the president individually and exclusively. This is, this is very important. The president only decides when and where to deploy troops. The Congress has no role in that. The notion uh, of the Congress is declaring war War is, the, a declaration of war does not determine whether or not there will be armed conflict. A declaration of war is the official recognition of a particular state of affairs between two uh, now potentially belligerent countries. It is a legal change in the status between the two countries. Uh, you, can, you can have a war that is declared and no shots be fired, and you can have full-on armed conflict without there being a piece of paper saying that we hereby declare that we are in a state of war. And if you don't believe that, there was no declaration of war against Afghanistan. There's no declaration, there's no piece of paper somewhere that says we, you know, um, the Congress assembled hereby declare war on the nation of whatever. You will not find that document anywhere. It wasn't declared. I'm pretty sure that in Iraq and in Afghanistan, um, there are thousands upon thousands upon thousands of corpses and, and the ruins of buildings that uh, have been put there by bombs from our country even though there isn't a little piece of paper that says officially, we are in a state of war with these people. It's very important that the left um, learn this, because their inability to distinguish these, these uh, parts of our Constitution, the parts of how our republic works, is one of the reasons why people don't trust the media. They don't know what they're talking about. Unfortunately, the media of today has 
become little more than glorify, uh, glorified teleprompter readers. They are infotainers, which is funny because they complain about Trump being an entertainer. I think the real complaint is he's better at doing it than they are and has better approval ratings for his entertaining shenanigans than they're getting for their not quite so entertaining, but uh, they're not quite so entertaining shenanigans. All right, I'm going to leave that there. Have a great day.